I want to thank Dr. Conrad Vine for uh, inviting me to speak here at this event, and not once but twice. It's, it's a real great pleasure to see you all and to meet you all and to speak here at the Village Church. Um, so let's talk about CBDCs and their impact on religious liberty. And we welcome you online. I hope you enjoy this presentation as well. So it's important for me to tell you this is not financial advice. I'm not giving you any financial advice. I don't know your personal situation. I can't possibly advise you on what you should do with your finances. But I'm here to educate you because we all really need to be educated on this subject. This is very important in order that we can um, have an understanding of what's coming and then make decisions for ourselves. Wise decisions, you know, prayerfully with God's counsel, of course. So as Dr. Vine said, uh, I'm an attorney. I've been an attorney for 25 years, and I practiced for 19 years before starting my own business uh, trading the financial markets. So as such, I'm constantly monitoring the policies of the central banks around the world, and it's my job, I consider it my job to know what's going on with money. My ministry is revelation 1317cbdcwatch.substack.com. And I based it, it's really... Um, a part of it is really Revelation 13, 17 is the key to my substack. It's, it's what I focus on because this is the enforcement mechanism that the two beasts of Revelation are going to use to try to force people to worship the beast during the end times. And we see that in Revelation 13, 17, and that no man might buy or sell save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So this no buy nor sell policy is going to be uh, instrumental in putting the pressure on people to worship the beast. And of course, we don't want to worship the beast. We want to follow the lamb wherever he goes. And we want to worship God and be sealed with, but with God's seal. So what are CBDCs? Central bank digital currency is a fully programmable, fully traceable digital currency that is centralized and distributed by a government or its central bank. So because it is centralized to one authority as opposed to being decentralized, it's fully controlled and programmed by the authority that issues it. This means that whoever issues it, your government, can number one, surveil all financial transactions that are made with the currency, and two, control when, where, and upon what you can spend the currency. With CBDCs, the government would have the authority to decide and the power to enforce how you may or may not spend the CBDC that is assigned to your digital wallet, which would be tied to your digital ID. CBDCs are designed to, as we'll see, they're designed to financially constrain the user in any way that the government wishes to constrain the user to elicit whatever behavior it wants from the user. So what this will require is um, Digital IDs, everyone will have to have a digital ID and a digital wallet to hold the central bank digital currency in. So that's something that we can expect down the line. And it's not just me saying this. This is not conspiracy theory. Um, it's very important to understand where this is coming from. The Bank of International Settlements is the central bank above all the central banks around the world. It is the central bank that all the central banks go to to facilitate cross-border payments and settlements and such, and they really set policy for all of the central banks. And you can find this video online or if you contact me or, or subscribe to my Substack, I've, you know, had, I've had links to this video and all the videos that I show, I'm not showing actually the video, but everything that I reference I've, I've written about in my Substack, so you can find it there or contact me. This gentleman is the Bank of International Settlements general manager, Augustin Karstens. And he said in his, this very short, it's like a one minute video clip that you can find on YouTube or Rumble or something. He said the central bank will have the absolute control on the rules and regulations that will determine the use of that expression of central bank liability and will have the technology to enforce that. So let's break that down, what does that mean? Central bank digital currency, when it's issued to you, it's considered a liability on the central bank. So that's what he's talking about when he says liability. They'll have the absolute control to create the rules and regulations that will determine how you will use that currency. And they will have the technology to enforce that. 
So this is not me saying this, it's not a conspiracy theory, this is coming directly from the Bank of International Settlements. And there's also another video that I've, I've shown before and, and written about online, and you can find it online from Steve Forbes of Forbes Magazine, where he said, government digital cash is a formula for tyranny. And he, he, it's like a three minute video where he talks about it. So it's not just me saying this, this is Steve Forbes of Forbes Magazine. What is true freedom? True freedom is financial freedom, financial transaction freedom, which is the freedom to conduct whatever financial transactions you choose to conduct, to spend your money as you please, to give to the charities of your choice, or to save as much of your money as you deem appropriate. That's really the definition of true freedom. So let's look at the difference between cash and CBDCs. So cash transactions are really, they're very private. They offer secrecy and anonymity that you need to have financial freedom. Uh, they can't monitor what you do with your cash. People can use cash to make transactions without leaving a paper trail, which is a fundamental right in a democratic society. Cash does not expire. Cash is not dependent upon electricity or network coverage in order to use it. You can use cash when the power is out or in the event of a network outage. Cash is physical. You can hold it in your hand. When you hold cash, you own cash. Now, Dr. Vine did a wonderful job of describing what happens with inflation. And of course, when you have cash, unfortunately, that loses value in an inflationary environment like we are in now. But at least you have control over the cash. With CBDCs, you, you don't have any kind of control. You will have no privacy in any financial transaction. All your, all your transactions with CBDC would be monitored by the authority who's issuing it. CBDCs are fully traceable, meaning every transaction is recorded and monitored by the central bank or the entity that's issuing it to you. Um, this would allow central banks to surveil and control financial transactions in ways that were previously impossible. This will be government surveillance of all Americans' financial transactions, and it's the antithesis of freedom and is contrary to the Fourth Amendment of our Constitution because it's an unreasonable search and seizure. There's no reason why the government should be able to monitor all of your transactions and see when and where and on what you're spending your money. CBDCs are programmable, meaning that the government can set the rules as to how, when, and on what items the currency can be spent. If the federal government wanted to outlaw the, or further restrict the, search, the sale or purchase of guns, it could program the CBD such that it would not work in a transaction to purchase a gun, which would be another attack on our Second Amendment rights. Um, also, the central bank can put an expiration date on the currency. The central bank can cause your CBDC to expire in 30 days or whatever period it deems it wants. It can do that for many reasons. We live in a consumption-based economy. So if the Federal Reserve were to determine that our spending numbers are not high enough, um, it could program the CBDC to expire within a certain period of time, forcing you to, to exchange that currency for goods, convert it to goods so that you, it doesn't evaporate on you. Or um, another reason, I've actually read that the central banks like this expiration date thing, it's as a feature. They think it's a good thing because they can better control the money supply. If the currency is expiring, they know how much of it is out there and they can, they can control the money supply better with an expiration date. So there's that reason as well. With a CBDC, the government can see all of your transactions in real time and tax you accordingly. They can mandate that any and all booster, stop, booster shots must be taken and they'll have the ability to turn off your money or freeze your balances if you do not comply. They can turn off your money or freeze your balance or adjust your balance if they don't like your political views or what you express on social media. They can turn off your money if they don't like your religious beliefs or practices. If the government passed a Sunday law mandating that all people worship on Sunday, the government could freeze your balances or otherwise restrict your spending of the CBDC in your assigned digital wallet if you don't comply with the Sunday law. 
the CBDC could be programmed so that it cannot be used to buy certain foods, goods, or services. So if, if your digital ID was tied to a carbon footprint score and a social credit score um, or some sort of arrangement like that, and you had, you had taken some flights or you had bought a certain amount of gas, if they deemed that your carbon footprint score was too high, they could program your money so that it cannot be used to buy further goods that would have a high carbon impact or a high carbon score. The Fed could institute negative interest rates, which would cause a portion of your money to be periodically deducted from your account or digital wallet. And this isn't unheard of because Japan has instituted uh, negative interest rates in 2016, and as of 2023, they still had a negative interest rate policy. So it is a possibility. Um, there was a period of time where they thought that um, the U.S. could go into negative rates when we were at zero for so long. Now, uh, the Federal Reserve has taken rates up. They've increased rates, so we're not in danger at the moment of seeing negative interest rates. But it certainly, it, it is a possibility that any country could decide to institute negative interest rates if it feels it, it wants to, which would mean your wallet would be deducted. CBDCs are being explored, tested, and developed worldwide. This isn't a theory, um, it's happening. According to data from the Atlanta Council, 114 countries are exploring or developing a CBDC. There is currently 60 countries in the advanced phases of a CBDC. And to date, there's about 10 countries that have la launched their own retail CBDC. There's two types of CBDCs, wholesale and retail. Retail is really what we're concerned about because retail CBDC is central bank digital currency that is issued to you, the individual consumer. Wholesale CBDC is central bank digital currency that's passed between financial institutions. So we don't really care about that. Um, what we care about is our liberties, our religious liberties, and our personal liberties. And that is, that is the retail CBDC that would impact that. So Nigeria has the e Naira, Bahamas has had the Sand Dollar, Antigua and Barbuda have Dcash. They're part of, um, there's an Eastern uh, Caribbean block that has Dcash. And all of these uh, countries that you see here that have Dcash are part of that. As of December 22, all G7 economies entered the development stage of a CBDC. China's pilot was expanded in 2023. Uh, one of the things that China tried, uh, they've been trying to f encourage adoption of their CBDC. They've had their pilot for quite some time now, and they're in a situation where they're finding difficult to get people to use it. They're, they're finding it difficult to get people to adopt it and use it. And they had the Asian Games in about October of 2023, and they were trying to encourage people to use the e yuan, the digital yuan, to purchase their Asian game tickets on the WeChat platform. But, you know, surprisingly, or maybe it's not surprising, even the Chinese people don't want to be enslaved by their government, by their communist government. Nobody wants to be enslaved by the global elites or their government. Um, and a 2022 survey conducted by the Bank of International Settlements revealed that 93% of the 86 central banks that it surveyed have or are developing a CBDC. It was projected that there could be 15 retail CBDCs publicly circulating by 2030. Um, it could be even sooner if they were to bring a, a crisis to accelerate the plan. It could happen even sooner than that. So here's um, a picture, a map of the CBDCs around the world as of December 2023, which was last time that this website was updated. Um, the orangish, uh, let's see. This is basically, these are the pilot areas. This color is the pilot program areas. And this is basically China, India. Um, the blue, which you don't, it's hard to see because the Caribbean countries are the ones that have launched as well as Nigeria here in blue. Um, and the, the green is uh, basically the research phase, those countries that are in the research phase. The purple are the countries that are in the proof of concept phase. So this gives you an idea around the world of how far 
each of the countries have advanced in a retail CBDC. And this is just with the retail only. And in this slide, you can see the list of countries that are in the pilot program stage. We see India, we see China, Kazakhstan, uh, the Russian Federation, Ghana, South Korea, and Uruguay are in the pilot program stage of a CBDC. So this isn't theory, this isn't, oh, this might happen, this is happening right now around the world. And here in the US, we have um, Biden's executive order number 14067. On March 9th of 2022, President Biden issued this executive order titled Ensuring Responsible Development of Digital Assets and it outlined plans to convert the US monetary system to a central bank digital currency system. We also have presently FedNow. FedNow launched in July of 2023 FedNow is really an instant payment infrastructure. It's really the foundation on which a CBDC can be built. Because really, in order to have CBDC, you need a fast way of sending CBDC. You need a fa fast way of transmitting it to customers, to businesses, everything else. So the Fed has started FedNow, which is basically the in instant payment infrastructure that would facilitate movement of CBDC if a CBDC were to be adopted. So the Fed describes it as a new instant payment infrastructure developed by the Federal Reserve that allows, oops, let's get back, that allows financial institutions of every size to provide safe and efficient instant payment services. So the way it works right now is the Fed um, created this program and they're inviting financial institutions to use it. And if they participate in it, they'll have access to instant payment funds from FedNow that they can deliver to their customers. And the, the way that they would encourage, the institutions would encourage that is, it enables them to offer you fast, convenient uh, payment transfer services. So it, like, like we use Zelle now or Cash App or something to send money in instantly, these banks would be able to do it without using those apps. They would be using the infrastructure and the funds from the Federal Reserve in order to offer those uh, to their consumers. The Fed has been, their, their goal is to have 10,000 financial institutions participating in this program. And when FedNow started, they had about 57 uh, institutions participating. That number's been steadily increasing, and the last time I checked, it was about 255, but it may have increased uh, recently since then. So what would a CBDC look like? There seems to be uh, two types of CBDC um, structures that seem to be emerging. So the first countries that came out with the CBDC, they were direct issue CBDCs that were issued directly from the central bank. Um, that's the type that you see in the Caribbean countries, in Nigeria, it's directly issued by the central bank, by the government. And the, the, that's the type of system that you see in China as well and in India. But what the Federal Reserve has been talking about and what um, the European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde has been talking about is sort of a synthetic CBDC where it wouldn't necessarily be issued directly by the central bank. There would be a bank that would be the intermediary between the customer and the Federal Reserve or the, the customer and the central bank. So the central bank issues it to the bank, the bank issues it to the customer. And uh, our Federal Reserve Chairman jo Jerome Powell confirmed in a September 22, in September 22, during um, an event hosted by the Bank of France, that CBDCs would would not be anonymous and they would be intermediated. And this is what he said: If we were to pursue CBDCs, it would, at a minimum, have the following four characteristics: First, it would be intermediated; second, it would be privacy protected; but third, is identity verified, so it would not be anonymous. It would not be an anonymous bearer instrument. And fourth, it would be transferable and interoperable. So it's interesting. They keep saying that, and the, the European Central Bank has said this as well, it would be privacy protected. When they say that, you have to look at what they're really saying. They're saying that 
you would have some financial privacy among your peers, but you don't have financial privacy from the authority that's issuing the CBDC. They could still see your transactions. So they throw around the word privacy, but it doesn't really mean your privacy is protected from the government, which is what we, you know, our constitution guarantees privacy from our, our government spying on us. So it's not really privacy as we would think privacy is. It's not privacy from the government, it's privacy from your peers. So the banks right now, uh, the major banks like JP Morgan Chase, they're working on deposit token systems. Um, JP Morgan Chase has already come out with a deposit token, deposit token system where they issue stable coins, which is kind of like, that's probably how the CBDC would operate. It would be a deposit token issued by the bank in between you and the central bank. But even with the intermediary, CBDCs would still be fully programmable by the central bank. All the elements of control that you see with CBDCs would still exist even with intermediaries. Our Fourth Amendment of the Constitution states the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation. Our Fourth Amendment really prohibits a direct issue CBDC, certainly, because that would be an unreasonable search and seizure. Um, our Constitution um, guarantees us that privacy from the federal government intruding in our lives in that way. Now with a synthetic CBDC, I think that's how they, they think they would skirt around it. Yeah. With a synthetic CBDC having a bank in between the central bank and you, they would argue that, well, there is no violation of the Fourth Amendment because we're not issuing the CBDC. Your bank is issuing it. J.P. Morgan Chase is issuing the CBDC, not the government. So you can't, you can't say that we're intruding on your Fourth Amendment rights. Well, we saw the same thing happen during this pandemic with the tech companies and censorship. The government was working very directly with these tech companies to censor all the information on the internet. The Twitter files showed that, that the government was working very closely with Twitter and even had access to their uh, content moderation algorithms to restrict free speech on those platforms. Even now on YouTube, you can't say that, um, well, I don't, I don't wanna, you can't say certain things <laughs> about Pestilence 19, let's, let's just say that. <laughs> um, so th that's the thing. <laughs> They're looking, we're looking at the same model in our finances as we see in censorship on the internet. You know, well, they're, they're gonna put these private institutions as intermediaries, but it's still, I would argue, it's the government still intruding on your, on your free speech rights, on your financial privacy. Uh, and we'll see how the courts decide that, you know, who knows. The European Central Bank has now announced that they are in the preparation stage of a CBDC. They announced that as of November 1st, 2023. Their announcement was issued on October 18th. Um, and then according to the press release, the ECB has designed a digital euro that would be widely accessible to citizens and businesses through distribution by supervised intermediaries. So they seem to be adopting that same synthetic CBDC model where they have a bank as the intermediary between the customer and the central bank. This design uh, envisages a digital euro as a digital form of cash that could be used for all digital payments throughout the euro area. It would be widely accessible, free for basic use, and available both online and offline. It would offer the highest level of, of privacy and allow users to settle payments instantly in central bank money. It could be used from person to person, point of sale in e-commerce and government transactions. But the ECB has signaled that there will be control. Um, in the same press release, the ECB stated that there would be limitations on the amounts of digital euros that individuals or businesses may hold in their digital wallets. On page 12 of the summary report that was issued, which I wrote about in my substack, 
at the conclusion of the investigation stage, they say in that report that holding limits were identified as an effective tool and therefore would be included in the design of a digital euro. So those limits would prevent you from being able to save digital euros. Similarly, with the expiration dates, if they were to put an expiration date, that also limits your ability to save. Um, so we're seeing that there will be control. That should, that should not be overlooked. That detail should not be overlooked. And although when Christine Lagarde had made that announcement, oh, let's go back one. When she had made that announcement, she had also said that uh, if you like cash, you can use cash. Cash, you know, it, cash or digital euro, it's your choice. Yeah, we'll, we won't take away your cash. But she's also indicated in this prank call, which I've also written about and posted the link for, um, she's acknowledged that in this prank call that there will be control. She thought she was speaking to the president of the Ukraine, but she was actually speaking to pranksters. Um, and she said there will be control. She noted that presently, if you spend a thousand euros in cash, you're doing something illegal. You're on what they call the gray market and you're subject to fines or imprisonment. She thinks that's too much. She thinks that the limit should be closer to three or 400 euros or perhaps even less. She, she doesn't feel that people should have the opportunity to use cash euros. Um, so there will be control, and I don't think they want to, keep, to let you keep cash. Once they roll out the digital euro, I think that you will see cash eliminated, based on what she said. So there's two things in talking about our religious liberties, there's two things that impact it. Number one is CBDCs, because obviously the government can restrict what you, how much CBDC you get based on your behavior. There's also, the second thing is tokenization of all private assets on the global unified ledger. This was announced in a plan in an annual report from the Bank of International Settlements. In June 20 of 2023, the Bank of International Settlements released one chapter of their annual report and it was titled Blueprint for the Future Monetary System, Improving the Old, Enabling the New. And in this report, they outlined their plan for a global unified ledger and tokenization of all privately held property. Now that would be your car, your house, any bank deposits you have, any securities that you own, anything that you own that has value, that's registered with some authority, those would be tokenized and they would exist on this programmable global unified ledger. So you don't have control over your objects, you know, your, your items, they would. According to the report, in a tokenized setting, money or assets become executable objects that are maintained on programmable platforms. Tokens are not me merely digital entries in a database, rather they integrate the records of the underlying asset normally found in a traditional database with the rules and logic governing the transfer process for that asset. And this is the diagram that you see. This is the diagram that they show in the report. So the token would be encoded with smart contracts um, and it would be encoded with rules and regulations about the asset, how you could own the asset, how you could retain ownership of your asset, how you could transfer the asset, if you could transfer the asset. That all would be programmed into the digital token. The report defines tokenization as a process of recording claims uh, on financial or real assets that exist on a traditional ledger on a programmable platform. And the report also states that, uh, let's get back to this. It's a little tough to see on this slide. The report also states that the data environment of the unified ledger, the unified ledger, the global unified ledger would have a data environment that would encompass all tokenized assets plus all information necessary to incorporate real-world events into any contingent performance of actions. 
Thus, the unified ledger would not just store tokenized versions of every piece of private property on the planet, but every piece of information from real-world events that could possibly impact assets or transactions on the global unified ledger. That's extremely broad and actually a little concerning. So what would that mean? How, what would that translate in real life? We saw what happened with the truckers in Canada, right? People who were involved in that protest, people who supported that protest, saw their bank accounts frozen. That could happen even more efficiently with CBDC and with tokenized private assets. You could see your assets completely frozen or taken away from you in such a situation. If the government didn't like what you were doing, if they wanted to put a stop to what you were supporting, they programmed the ledger, they programmed the tokens, and you don't control your assets, they would control your assets. They could easily take all your assets if they don't like what we're doing. So in the, con in the context of civil li uh, religious liberty, if we're not worshiping on the right day, we could lose all our assets. But you know, we should count it a blessing to be in that position. If the Sunday law comes down and we do not comply, and we lose all our assets, that's a blessing because that means we're on the right side of this great controversy. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't want to scare you. <laughs> I want to show you what's possibly going to happen, but let's not be scared by this. Let's be encouraged. <laughs> not that we want to lose all our assets, but, you know, <laughs> we know, we know from Revelation 13, 17 that we are going to be under some serious financial repression. So... There's a very interesting documentary that you may want to take a look at if you get a chance. It's called The Great Taking by David Rogers Webb. And he's an interesting guy. He was a hedge fund guy. And he wrote this book and he did this documentary. And what he describes is, it's very interesting. Um, he says that all, and he, he writes about how all, or most of the states at least, their laws in the Uniform Commercial Code were changed, such as the securities that you think you own, you don't really own, you have an entitlement interest to them, according to him and, and his research. And if there were to be an economic collapse, the point of his documentary is if there were to be an economic collapse, there's a procedure in place wherein all your securities that you think you own, your 401k, your pension, would just be swept away. They, they, would just, they would just take it. And it, that's the great taking that he describes. Um, and uh, and he, he suggests that we could see an economic collapse with um, mass corporate insolvencies, with more bank failures. We could see that type of, uh, that could be triggered, uh, that could trigger an economic collapse. Um, but his, the, what he describes is serious, but I think that what's even more serious is the global unified ledger and tokenization, because that's everything. He's just talking about your securities that you own, your 401k, or any stocks or bonds that you own that are you know, governed by an exchange. This is much wider. This is your car, your house, everything. Um, so his documentary is very interesting, but the greater threat to human liberty around the globe is CBDC, and tokenization of private property on the global unified ledger. Those are the two greater threats. So how many people have seen this picture and how many have you heard from the World Economic Forum that it's 2030, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy? This is how they would accomplish that. All they need are CBDCs and the tokenization of all privately held property on a global unified ledger. These mechanisms and also what he describes in the great taking um, could accomplish this. So what can we do? There was another thing that I wanted to mention. Um, I've been following this um, investigative reporter. She's really very good. Her name is Whitney Webb. And she was describing that she's talked about CBDCs. She's talked about the Global Unified Ledger as well. But if you look at the... Um, World Economic Forum website right now, they put a lot of emphasis on cybersecurity. And they predict or they anticipate that a cyber event, a global catastrophic cyber event will occur. 
And in January 2023, Jeremy Jurgens, who is the managing director at the WEF, said that a global catastrophic mutating event will strike the world in two years, meaning 2025. Well, now we've entered 2024. So we're getting closer to this point where they anticipate a cyber attack could happen. Um, Dr. Conrad Vine did an excellent job of showing what happens to a country when the currency collapses, when you have an economic collapse. I mean, that could happen. We could see the implementation of CBDCs and tokenization of private property as a result of an economic collapse, like he, he described had happened in Germany. We could see it with a cyber attack. We could see it with de-dollarization and erosion of the dollar. Any one of these things, or even a combination of these things, could trigger um, the type of crisis that they would need to impose CBDCs and tokenization of all private property. Um, because people don't want this. They really don't want this. So he indicated, so Jeremy Jurgens indicated that he expects by 2025 a, a catastrophic cyber event that would be global would occur. And the World Economic Forum website says that we should prepare for a COVID-like cyber pandemic that would spread faster and farther than a biological virus with an equal or greater economic impact. If the cyber COVID if cyber COVID mirrored the pathology of the novel coronavirus, 30% of infected systems would be asymptomatic and spread the virus while half would continue functioning with performance severely degraded. So they're trying to make the same uh, idea, they're trying to apply the same idea of how COVID, remember when they were calling normal healthy, healthy people just asymptomatic? No, <laughs> I think they're gonna do the same thing with our computer systems and they're gonna try to shut down the internet and then, or have a cyber attack occur, which would allow them to shut down the internet. And then what we would see is a move toward um, a, a, a Patriot Act, similar to what we saw after 9-11 for the internet. And what Whitney Webb has been researching is the policies of the World Economic Forum. Um, their policy response to that type of an event would be to shut down the internet, completely shut down the internet, and then when it comes back up, you would lose all anonymity and all privacy on the internet. You would have to access the internet with a digital ID. There would be a move toward um, no anonymity on the internet, no accessing it in private. You, every, everything that you access in the internet, on the internet would be surveilled and um, controlled and would be monitored by AI, which then would do some predicted policing. And she's talked about this in, in several interviews and she has a website called um, Underground Hangout. So if you're interested, you could check that out. So she suggests that what we could see in the internet a year from now is very different from the internet that we see now. And if there's any information that you want to have that you may not want to be tracked and looking for later, um, you might want to, she suggested and I agree that you might want to like find that information on the internet and lock it down, you know, download it onto a hard drive, um, secure it for yourself offline because if this type of event were to happen, um, they'll take down the internet and then when they bring it back up, you won't have privacy anymore. Uh, that's certainly a possibility. And that could come also with an imposition of CBDCs, tokenization of all private property. They could do that all at once. So what can we do? Um, so there's um, many things that we could do. Um, a lot of the speakers have talked about um, having your own garden. That's a wonderful thing to do. Um, we should move to the country like Elder Hines talked about if we can. I think an excellent thing to do would be to improve our foraging skills. Because Matthew 24, 20 says that, pray that your flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath. And I think we should pray that because at some point we do know that we will not be able to buy or sell. Our assets will be taken away from us and we will be on flight during the time of trouble. And yes, God will provide for us. 
but wouldn't it be nice if we could help God provide for us by being able to identify those plants that are nutritious and healthy and safe to eat? You know, improving our foraging skills could make that time a little bit easier. Find um, and buy food from a local farmer when things get tough. You could do that or grow your own garden. I recommend that you get off high Wi-Fi and hard, hardwire your home. Um, Number one, your internet will be faster, but it will be uh, less, it will, it will make it harder for them to spy on you. But of course, we, we run around with these phones and these digital devices that are listening to everything that we say, so <laughs> you might want to secure that too. I would also throw out your smart TV. Um, there's actually, if you look at the terms and conditions in these smart TVs, they say that you give them the permission to film you and to photograph you in your home. Um, so I would not have a smart TV. That's a very dangerous thing to have right now, as is a, a new car. New cars have a lot of surveillance technology built into them. And they basically spy on you constantly. And they can, they can see your driving habits. They can see when you're push, pushing the gas, how much you're pushing the brake. You know, if you're a hard breaker or a soft breaker, there's a lot of uh, surveillance capabilities in your new cars as well. Um, so if at all possible, we should avoid becoming reliant on these controls. Avoid CBDCs where possible. Avoid digital IDs and vac vaccine passports as much as possible. Use cash as much as possible while we can. And avoid non-cash methods of payment when we can. So the point, the point of all of this and the point of my Substack is I want to implore you to awaken and prepare. You know, let's, let's not be sleeping Adventists because what all of these things are telling us is that they're putting in place the pieces to enforce uh, the enforcement mechanisms behind Revelation 13, 17. So now's the time to prepare and really be ready for Jesus to come because when the time of trouble comes, how, how would we handle it? How would we handle really difficult times? I don't think that we can quite imagine the difficulty of the times that are coming. And, and um, you know, we heard that earlier um, from Dr. Vine's presentation and other presentations. The time of trouble is going to be really difficult. It's going to be worse than what anybody's ever seen before in history. And we should be prepared for that. And the way we can be prepared for that is to use the tools described in Ephesians 6. You know, have faith, have the breastplate of righteousness, have the truth, use the word of God. We need to really strengthen our relationships with God during these times and be, be able to depend on him for anything and have, just be totally dependent on God because we're going to need to be during these difficult times that are ahead of us. Romans 13, 11 says, And knowing the time, it, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is when our salvation is nearer than when we believed. And that's absolutely true. These things, these events that we're seeing are showing us that the time is short and we truly are living in the last days. So, again, someone else quoted earlier, Matthew 6, 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust dust corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. And, of course, God provided food for Elijah. He will pr provide for us, too. Um, so we can just depend on him and have faith, and he'll take care of us. And how do we show our love to God? We keep his commandments. And we know that Revelation 14, 12 says those who um, follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They keep the commandments of God. They have the testimony of Jesus. They have the faith of Jesus. That's what we want to be. That's what we want to be working towards. We should be preparing in that our goal should be to be walking with God the way Noah walked with God, the way Enoch walked with God. You know, these times won't seem so difficult if we have a very strong relationship with God. So God doesn't want us to have a spirit of fear. So we should not be afraid. We should be encouraged. And we should be a help to those around us. So that was my presentation this morning. <laughs> thank you for listening. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Mr. Tompkins. Uh, that was eye-opening.
uh, we chatted about this yesterday in the subway. Yes. And uh, I was aware of the CBDCs, but the unified global ledger was complete news to me. And um, it strikes me that in the last three years, we have realized that there are globalist forces in our world who do not have the interests of individual citizens at heart. That's correct. And we've also seen that there is a yearning for absolute power yes. uh, on the part of many in authority around the world. We've also seen that constitutions and civil rights acts and bills of rights mean nothing when a crisis hits. Absolutely. And so um, we find our security knowing that we are, uh, our names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yes. And when we know that our names are in the Lamb's Book of Life, it means that we can ride through whatever storms this world is going to throw at us. Yes. So we'd like to say thank you for your presentation last night and this morning. Thank you. Um, last night was on critical thinking skills. And um, I was introduced to those with my son about, from about the age of six or seven. He started using critical thinking on me, and it was very unpleasant, <laughs> um, I can assure you. But we want to thank you for that uh, presentation last night and for your presentation today. Thank you. And your presentation is on our church website. So if you look at villagesta.org, you can go there and you can download um, both presentations. They're up there. And uh, you can look at these inf this information for yourself and do your own digging around. So we'd like to say thank you for the time, the effort, the care you've put into this. Thank and you. people can follow you on there on your substack. Yes, yes. That's um, Revelation... Revelation 1317cbdcwatch.substack.com. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that's in your presentation that's yes. online as well. Yes. And so people can find that for themselves there. Yes. So we'd like to say thank you once again, and God bless you in thank your you. ministry. And you. Uh, as you work in the heart of the financial markets, you see these things happening every day. Um, so you have a different perspective to most of us. But we're grateful that you come and shared your expertise in this area because I think for myself and for many of us, this has been eye-opening as to just how close we are to the mechanisms being in place to impose the final crisis on humanity. We are very close. I mean, we can see them erecting, like say you wanted to enclose a, a herd of animals. You know, we're seeing them erect the stanchions and lay the fence in place that they can just, they can just raise it instantaneously when they want to. All they need is the right crisis. Now, whether that's a cyber attack or it's de-dollarization goes too far and the dollar has lost all confidence around the world, any one of those things could trigger it. They have all of these things in place. The digital dollar project, the pilot programs that we've done in the United States for a digital dollar have been very successful. And I didn't cover that in my presentation, but um, the, the pilot programs that we did, Project Hamilton, showed that um, the digital dollar could, could accommodate faster and more transactions that we see now with our credit cards, exponentially faster. So they already have this waiting to implement. It, they just need a crisis to implement it. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we pray for God's blessings in your ongoing ministry Praise and God. your ongoing work. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.